book of Philippians that we've been studying through, and today really looking at joy from generosity, and I just wanted to thank some people who generously have given some time recently. If you've been through the glass corridor over here in our children's wing, uh, you've noticed it's been fresh painted and some new decorations and woodworking craftsmanship done on the wall, and so that was from uh, Kevin and Karen Salinas, who designed as well as Marvin Studebaker and Paula Coyne that helped uh, put that design together, and it's really beautiful. You might want to take a look at that and just uh, let families know we care about them and their kids, and and uh, so just thank you for that uh, generous uh, amount of time and work that that took. And thanks also for all those working uh, in the children's uh, department and things. We had Todd to give an announcement last week about needing children's leaders. And we had some people respond a little bit. And, and uh, so we're looking forward to hopefully training some new folks. We still maybe need more because it's a, a good uh, amount of ministry to be done in there and people needed. Um, we had a good uh, little Nerf gun war here for uh, the middle school kids this Friday night. And Becky and, and Janessa and others stepped in to, to help out with that. And, you know, that's outside their job description and things, but just giving a hand, and that's so helpful. So uh, thanks so much. Also this morning, to see it's neat to see some college students back in town around this year. It's a special time of year uh, where some college students come home for Thanksgiving. So good to see you all college folks. Give them a hug before they uh, leave out of town again to go back to school and things. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see you all. So as we talk about uh, generosity, you know, actually joy comes from generosity. How many have ever been in a situation where you've seen some spontaneous generosity happen? You know, how many of you have seen, seen something like that? Like, wow. And, and it's even better when it's unexpected or it takes you by surprise or just kind of wells up, uh, you know, where there's no rhyme or reason. It just happens. And, uh, and you're like, wow, that's just like a senseless act of kindness and, and generosity. It's not even like they knew those people that well. It wasn't friends or family. It was maybe to a complete stranger. And so that always just hits me uh, when those kinds of things happen. And I think there's joy in that. I think the book of Philippians would say there is joy in that. Uh, in a McDonald's in uh, southern uh, Indiana, there was a woman that was looking at the car behind her, and it was a dad and his four kids in a minivan, and it was Father's Day. And so she said, you know, uh, to the clerk, she said, would you just, uh, here's a payment for the meal for the guy behind me, and if you could just wish him a happy Father's Day, I'd really appreciate that. And as she drove off, they did that. They wished the man and his kids a happy Father's Day. And that man uh, said, you know, I would like to take care of the car behind me and, uh, and, and just wish them a happy Father's Day. Well, from 8.30 p.m. till 12.30 midnight when that store closed, 167 cars had their meals covered for them. I suppose, again, until the last person in line finally, like, maybe, uh, you know, had, I, I guess they didn't have anybody else to pay for. But uh, what, a, what a just when you hear things like that, like, wow, paying it forward. You guys have heard that cliche before. Just kind of a cool thing to say, hey, let's pay it forward. Uh, take care of somebody else. And, and, and when that just wells up out of seemingly no reason, I think it says a lot. I think it's contagious. I think it's a cool thing. Uh, it sometimes maybe happens around this year. Some are thinking Christmas. It's times we're giving and, and uh, it's giving. And some say, well, it's time for receiving. All, some of you said, man, this type of season's not my favorite at all from the stress and pressure and being in malls and, and shopping and things as we head towards the Christmas season. But we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And so it's also appropriate time to end the book of Philippians because it just scripture hits right at this time where we're talking about generosity. I think there are many out there that says, well, you know, we don't believe that uh, Christians, the doctrines that they believe uh, and the Bible that they believe in really changes anything regarding generosity. And I would say that research just uh, counteracts that. Uh, I read, read, read this article, it says, how much do your beliefs affect your actions? Does belief in God change the way you live? John A. Shields, assistant professor of political science at the University of Colorado, writes about a study given by Arthur Brooks drawn on some 10 data sets. Brooks finds that faith, faith in God is amongst the best predictors of charitable giving. Faithful Americans are not only much more likely to give money and volunteer their time to religious and secular institutions, they are also more likely to provide aid to family members, return incorrect change, help a homeless person, and donate blood. In fact, despite expecting to find just the opposite, Brooks concluded, I have never found a measurable way in which secularists are more charitable than people of faith. 
And he gives a number of statistics that support that. So your beliefs in God and what God is doing, not just your beliefs, but what he's doing in your heart to change you and to be in different people uh, from the inside out, there's no explanation for that except spiritually what's happening inside you. And I think there's a joy there. It's going to be talked about today from what Paul, even in a Roman prison cell, as he is talking affectionately to this colony of Rome in Philippi, this church in Philippi, he's talking affectionately because they are a joyful and giving church. The whole book of Philippians that we have covered verse by verse thus far is talking about this little church in Philippi and what it's meant to Paul and his ministry and, and, and for the church at that time going forward being a witness to us today. Because we know the environment, we know the atmosphere that is created when we see acts of generosity that just spontaneously uh, erupt, and, and sometimes the generosity is planned beforehand, and both of those things are good. And so we're going to read from Philippians 4, 10 through 19, and, and cover the last of this book. This will be the last part of Philippians that we cover, and see if we can't grab onto a little bit more joy and find it in generosity. The reason why I picked Philippians some uh, many weeks ago was... I thought, you know, this is just what our church needs. This is election season. There's a lot of negative. There's all kinds of ads going on TV. There's a lot of backfighting and going back and forth with different groups. And I thought, the Christians need to rise above what's happening around our society and circumstances and really figure out where our joy really comes from. And today we're going to find out that generosity has a part of that. Verse 10 of chapter 4, the last chapter of Philippians. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintances with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid that once, you sent me aid uh, more than once when I was in need. Not only that, I, not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So there's some famous scripture again uh, that is found in this book of Philippians. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That is some good scripture to uh, hold on to. Well, in this section of scripture, we're going to draw out four points or four ways that I see that generosity really leads to uh, joy. That is an aspect of, of our joy. And I think it's appropriate. This is leading up to Thanksgiving. Uh, that wasn't planned. That's just the way the book works. So. Let's uh, look in here. First, uh, verse 11 there, Paul says, I, I, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I, I've learned to be content in every situation. So whether well-fed or in plenty, I've learned the secret of being content. And he, and, and he says, I can actually make it through anything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. He's talking about his situations and his circumstances. He, he'll get through. And Paul is a man that put himself out there. He generously gave his time, he generously gave his life to the mission of Christ, to where he was shipwrecked and snake-bitten, he preached, he was almost stoned to death, uh, he was put in prison, um, he was whipped, uh, and, and all of these things happened to him, and he put himself out there as a sacrifice uh, for the Lord, for the kingdom of God. And so here's really the first point I, I draw out here, is my strength is strengthened when I'm generous. When you put yourself out there and, and put yourself seated and trusted in the Lord, like, hey, I'm not going to make this unless the Lord brings me through, it's going to build your strength. Your uh, relying on God is like a, a, a muscle, a, a spiritual muscle that needs to be worked in order to build your faith. And one of those parts of that spiritual muscle is when you practice uh, faith and by being generous like you wouldn't otherwise have enough you you sacrifice in your giving to where you otherwise wouldn't have had a, enough uh, except for Christ come through 
in Corinthians, it talks about the, the little church in Philippi saying they gave, the ma little Macedonian church, Philippi, gave more than they could afford. They gave more than they could afford, and they wanted to even give more. So they gave sacrificially. They gave their time and resources, money. I'd say, sadly, many Christians never get to experience the great blessing of having their faith build up exponentially because it's just been too hard for them to fully trust God generously. And so they never get the opportunity to have that muscle flex in such a way that they're actually growing to a next level of Christianity or belief and trust in God. And, and so they're like, oh, I wish my faith was like him. I wish my faith was like him, but I can't step out. I can't step out. Well, this is one way that God helps you to step out is, is to have you sacrificially give generously and so he can build your faith by seeing how he's going to come through. A man came to me one time and asked me if I thought we should all tithe. I responded, well, I think, I, I, so I think the Bible teaches us to. He said, well, should we also honor the Sabbath also? Is it, you know, other Old Testament laws and things? And I said, well, I think you're mistaken a little bit. The idea of giving uh, generously is also a New Testament teaching. In fact, the idea of giving hilariously goes beyond a tithe towards generosity. We remember everything belongs to God. The Bible says everything belongs to God. And he's given us uh, a 10%, uh, only asks us to, 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 to give 10% back and to keep 90%. Everything else he's given us. I said, but look, God is never holding a gun to anybody's head. Nobody is forcing you to give. In fact, he doesn't want a, a reluctant giver. He wants a joyful giver. And it's a blessing that we receive when we actually give. I think this man actually went away a little bit perturbed at me. And I went away a little bit confused because I, I was thinking, did I just have a conversation with another brother in Christ that was sort of debating whether we should be generous towards God? I think surely, surely that we know that being a hilarious giver, it, it, it goes beyond the bottom line of the lowest degree of the law. Surely we know that everything Christ came, he didn't nullify a single law, but he fulfilled all of those things. And when we trust him, it's to our benefit. Even the fact that he loves us, we love back because he first loved us. We have a much better part of this deal. The idea of being generous with God and the blessing uh, that comes from that is not my idea. I wanted to say that. This is not my idea. Listen as we listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You know what he's saying there? He's like, trust me, trust me. I want you to believe in me. I want you to have faith in me. See what I can do for you. See what, how I want to open the gates of heaven to bless you in such ways that your barns will not be able to hold the blessing within them. As God takes care of me when I give generously and thus giving away something I thought I needed, my faith is made stronger. It's like a spiritual muscle being built up. A couple of illustrations of this, I, I think, is one, maybe just one illustration at least, is, is I was going on that Mexico mission trip years back, and I've shared the story before, and I was thinking, I'm going on this Mexico mission trip, I'm excited about it, I'm ready to do this work, we're, you know, building orphanages uh, for kids that didn't even have a home down there, it was important, and then uh, uh, check balances early in my marriage, the check balances that was supposed to go to my mortgage payment for our house. We'd only been in the house just over a, a year or so. I think, oh my goodness, where did that money go? <laughs> and, and is it even responsible for me to leave on a mission trip when I haven't taken care of my home? I haven't taken care of making that payment. And so I thought that's the irresponsible thing, the illogical thing. And at that time, I was in ministry and things, but I also could paint a house here and there. I thought, but I find a, do I need to find a house to paint, to fund this, and then I can go do this? I thought, maybe I should be staying here. But I heard the Lord say, no, go. Even when it's not logical, even when it makes no sense, I want you to put yourself fully in me. And so I was like, okay, but I can c confess to you that it was, I'm on this mission trip, there is this baggage, this black cloud that's following me on this trip. 
And as every message, every devotional, I'm trying to smile with the kids. Hey, Jesus loves you. All right, hey, let's do mission work. I'm thinking, my Lord, why didn't you take care of this? Why have I got this plow I'm pulling behind me, or this black cloud that I'm going to have to face when I get back home? And what's my wife thinking of being back home because and, and, and I didn't take care of this? And what's going on? Well, so every devotion and things we got through is able to, the Lord said, hey, have I ever let you be unfed? Are you not clothed? Have you not been taken care of? Trust in me. It's like, okay, Lord, but you could have taken care of that. Then I trust. And, and, and so I'm just kind of doing this battle, but I'm doing, my, I'm doing my position as a good missions worker, youth minister. And we get back into San Diego, and, and I make my call back to my wife. First time I got a phone in my hand, call from my motel room, and Kelly says, Alan, hey, guess what? A check came in the mail. How cliche. A check came in the mail. And it was for the amount of our house payment. I was like, wow. You know, where did that come from? Well, you know when you, like, uh, you wrote that letter to the city magistrates a year ago because you felt like they overappraised our house when we bought it, the taxes we thought were higher? And uh, I said, yeah, bigly. And she said, well, they agreed with us. And so they sent us a check. And it was for the amount of our new mortgage payment. I'm like, wow. Drop the phone. It's like, wow, okay, Lord, I trust you. He said, well, he, he could point to a hundred other things in my past, but things like that where he came through. And again, have I ever been without a meal? Have I ever been without clothing? Have I ever been without shelter? And as I think of those things, like, no, no, no. But the Lord wants us to trust him and trust him in more i've talked to randy adams our northwest baptist convention executive and he said you know alan he said just like uh, uh, just a, a year and a half ago we sent 160 northwest baptists down to thailand to be a uh, uh, support to the missionaries in that country and to take care of their kids and the youth group and the vacation bible school and, and just so those missionaries would have an opportunity to sit in a room like this and worship together and sing songs together because we take that for granted here we're able to do that all the time but when you you're a, mission, a missionary in another country on the mission field, you don't have the benefit of what we're just experiencing this morning, gathering together and worship and praise and hearing these songs that we're singing together that Carrie's doing a fabulous job lifting up the Lord in praise. We don't have the opportunity. And so they sent 160 missionaries down there. Now, you would think, what do you think the cost of that is to send that many people from here down to Thailand for 10 days? $450,000. We're like, well, is that responsible? That's for 10 days, a minute. Well, and what about the money needed for the churches up here in the Northwest and the mission? He says every time we've done something like that, the money doesn't go down that comes into the coffers of the Northwest Baptist Convention and the churches in the Northwest. It always goes up. There's, like a, there's, a, there's a, a, an exponential growth in the amount of money coming in. Money goes out like crazy, like for these 10 days, and much more money begins to come in. Why? Because the, the muscle of the heart, of the generosity and the joy that comes out of that has exponentially got bigger. There is more, to, more uh, uh, resources, more uh, uh, money, more time, more people that are being invested because of that. It doesn't make sense. But it's true, and it's why. It's because our faith is built. Whenever our faith is built, we begin to trust Him. Our generosity also goes up, and our joy goes up with it. Moving on, verse 14, it says, Yet it was good of you to share my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintances with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. This is an amazing thing that's happening here. And it points to this point. When I'm generous, I experience the gratitude of others. Now, you just need to ask yourself, do we believe? Do we believe the words of Jesus? In Acts 20 to 35, it says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, how many of you believe it's actually more blessed to give than receive? 
Is that something that we really believe? It's either right around Christmas time. Maybe where some of us are thinking about, hey, the thing, things that I would really like to have, the things I'd really like to buy. And, and maybe some of you are those, you, those Christmas list people that have a Christmas list, but you, you reserve some money back for anything that you didn't get that you wanted for Christmas. You, you go shopping after Christmas to make sure you got the things on your list. And, and, and you need to ask yourself, are you really, is it really you're getting the most bang, the most joy out of giving than receiving? I mean, that's cliche, you know, we've, we've heard it enough from, from the word of God. It's more blessed to give and receive. Yeah, we'll all say that. It sounds good, sounds great. Is that what permeates our thinking? I'm not talking about just giving to our families and the relationships we know and that are going to give the same present for about the same amount of money back to us that we spend on somebody else and exchanging of gifts. I'm talking about giving to people that are never going to give us back. I'm mean, talking about giving to people that we've, uh, you, you, the, we're never going to get our back scratched for scratching their back. It's not a, a, rela- a relationship that we're just involved in. It's a relationship that you may just be the giver. It's not very natural, really. I mean, we, we, we say it's like, oh, that's the most natural thing for Christians. It's not very natural. I and mean, even Paul acknowledges it. He says, you know, uh, uh, back then when you gave, you, know, you guys know that you were the only church to give. When I was in the Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Well, I wish that we can know, we can, you know, empathetic, if, if some of us are struggling in this area, we can be empathetic and knowing, hey, there was other churches back then that were struggling in the same way. We're trying to hold on to the resources that we have, hold on, give as much because, well, we're, we're hanging on for other things, or we got some other things in mind, and instead of just like, hey, let's let it go. I think many times... We could probably learn from our kids. You know, they have such a, a soft heart um, and for giving. They have a soft heart for just listening to the voice of God. And, and, and sometimes, you know, some of us get a little callous. Or, well, kids these days, you know, and they want their iPads and they want their iPhones and they want this and want that. But many times if we look at the heart of kids, they just are ready to give and give exponentially. I think of my youngest daughter, Megan, who gets a, a $10 commission, uh, you know, allowance each, each uh, month for the chores and stuff that she does. Um, and so she gets $10, $10 so she's, she's kept, she's a good saver because she keeps money, but she's always trying to give it away. It's not out buying things, but she's trying to give it away. And our family know that, trying not, just not to take advantage of her and her, her sisters and things either. She gives loans to her sisters and stuff sometimes. But she's, a, she's the youngest. But Kelly and I will be talking in the kitchen. Oh, I got this bill. I'm like, oh, honey, we got to pay that bill. And if Megan hears us, she said, Dad, I got money. I got 200 bucks up in there in my piggy bank. You guys can have that and pay that. It's like, no, no, Megan, that's, keep your money. Quit trying to, keep, to give your money away. Keep your money that you might want to buy a toy or something. And so here I am, like, going against everything I'm talking about, generosity this morning. <laughs> but it's like, Megan would just, uh, some is not knowing the value of, of money and things and stuff, but she just wants to just give it away. A- and I was like, wow, well, we could learn something maybe from that. I have a video clip, just want us to just look at this point and just maybe look, is it really more blessed to give and receive? Feeling wise, how do we feel when we receive the gift? Versus how do we feel when we've been able to give it? And in a place or situation where we're able to get nothing back and we know nothing's coming back. So I just want to look at this clip. I think some of you, I think you remember going to that concert, Toby Mack concert a few years ago. And uh, I I remember still uh, the man that was sharing that night in between some of the singers and things. He said, uh, you know, every three seconds, there's a line of kids in this globe, on this globe, and every three seconds, one, two, three, one of the kids drops off at the back of the line that dies of starvation. And uh, I remember that night, Katie, you know, whispering over, saying, Dad, Mom, we got to support one of those kids. And uh, so we get this, you know, we saw Fanny from uh, Rwanda, Rwanda uh, several years ago when we first, she's just a, just a little girl and things, and and it's neat to see these cars. Now she's grown up a preteen, uh, getting stronger and bigger. She's got a big smile on her face. She's well clothed. She's well fed. Uh, and she's being taken care of. And there's almost, I don't know if there's anything that just gives me greater satisfaction than saying, hey, there's going to be one person in heaven that says, wow, thanks for taking care of me. Thanks for uh, giving uh, your resources um, so that uh, I get to learn about Jesus, first of all, but also I was just taken care of. And there's, there's a good feeling there. 
of, wow, it's, it's more blessed to give than receive. So I know what Paul was talking, I know what the Philippi uh, church was thinking when they were giving more beyond what they could even give and wanted to even give more. And I hope that will be the kind of church that we will be also. Moving on, verse 17. Not that I desire your gifts, but what I desire is that more will be credited to your account. Now, what, what's he talking about there? Well, the point here is when I'm generous, I get to invest in my eternal home. It, it, it was Philippi, they're saying the people of Philippi is investing in the kingdom of God. Now, you know, I'm 45 years old, and, and I don't know if I got another 45 years, probably not, but it's kind of the point where I'm in that middle ages where I may have a less years ahead of me, and who knows if I have another day ahead of me or not, but it's, you start counting, there's probably less days ahead of me than behind me at some point, and it makes me think of all those financial advisors that I met early in my marriage life and stuff to get advice and counsel and things that said, you got to think long term, you got to invest for the long term. And now I would say, you know, looking back is how short my life is feeling. I don't think they were thinking long term enough. Paul is saying you got to go long term beyond just preparing for your retirement years on this earth. Have it go ahead, credit to your account for eternity. Because you're going to spend far more time, far more uh, in that place, and, and, and you're going to be far more uh, invested in what's there, and, and, and that being so much more important than just the little bit you invest of time on this planet. That goes on for trillion and trillion and trillions of years. This is just maybe 70, 80 years. It's a great place to invest that we have credited to our account. We have an eternal account that Paul seems to be saying that you can invest in. Your resources, your time, your, your ministry, what you want to give here to other people, things that last beyond this world. I was reading a little bit of a book, of Ron Sider's his book uh, called A Lot of Lattes. It was called, why, the caption was, Why American Christians Don't Give Away More Money. He says, small charitable donations of the richest Christians in history. He says, says why? He says, just if, if the regular Christians that just attending churches in America just regularly uh, just gave a full tithe, there'd be an extra $46 billion available for kingdom work. He talked about what all that money would go, like 150,000 new missionaries, 50,000 new theological students who are in the developing world that are ministering to these people, 5 million microloans to poor entrepreneurs, enough food, clothing, and shelter for 6,500,000 current refugees in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, uh, a global campaign to fight uh, malaria and other diseases to sponsor 20 million children uh, wor worldwide for food. The conclusion of the author was surely right that reasonable, generous financial giving of ordinary American Christians just reasonably would generate a staggering amount of money to change the world. I'm like, wow, but in the course of the 20th century, he reports, as our personal disposable income quadrupled, the percentage donated by American Christians actually declined. Like, why, why would that be? Well, could it could be that we're not understanding how to invest long, long, long term. That Paul is saying, hey, don't just think about just this life. Don't just think about investing in the temporal, but invest in eternity, in your eternal home. Have you ever thought about what's being credited to your account in heaven? It's there waiting for you. I mean, the idea's been around a long time. The pharaohs of the Egyptian uh, empire at their peak, and then when they would pass away a pharaoh, they would send gold and jewels in these big tombs for them, and some were discovering some of those things today and things, and, and they had an idea that there was a life after this one. And they would send the stuff with them, only they didn't really know what the afterlife was really like, and they didn't know how to get there. They didn't know it was through uh, Christ Jesus, but they knew of an afterlife, and that kind of proves the point in Ecclesiastes 7.2 that talks about God has put eternity in the hearts of mankind. We believe mostly that there is a life after this one. They understood sending finances ahead, sending jewels and gold ahead to be with them, but only they didn't understand how to really contribute to the real kingdom of God. How can we generously contribute to our heavenly account? By sharing the gospel with people, by inviting them to activities and places where they're going to hear the gospel, by giving generously to your church. Some may not know that this church gives a portion of everything that comes in to something called the cooperative program, CP, cooperative program. And some of you don't know that that cooperative program money that comes to this church 
goes and funds missionaries all around the world to be the largest fully funded missionary force ever in the history of humanity is funded through CP. More missionaries are, more doctors, more dentists, more water uh, uh, builders for clean wells and water purifiers than any other organization. The organization that helps most people in this country is donated through CP, second only to the Red Cross in fighting hurricanes, fires, uh, natural tornadoes. is all done by the CP. If you want to support the, the American military through the chaplaincy program, the majority of those chaplains are paid for through CP giving. I think you should also know that out of 501 churches here in the Northwest, just 16 recently added to that, makes 501 churches, that this church is the amount that we give to CP giving is 20th out of 501. This church is given very generously to the Coopera program in a, in a way that is affecting the entire globe for the cause of Christ. I think it's important for us to know and be encouraged because we live in the Northwest, one of the lowest church areas in the entire country. It's good for us to know that in the South, the percentage from most churches in the South that goes to CP programs is 4.85%. In the Northwest, it's 7.85%. We give almost, almost double what the South is giving percentage-wise from each church. Do you know what Fairfield Baptist percentage is? 10%. You give a full tithe to CP giving. You're affecting the world in a very generous way, and I, I think it's a, important for you to know that. I think that's something to celebrate, that you are indeed sending dollars to your eternal home for everything you give here, not only supporting the ministry here in West Eugene and Bethel Danebo, but you're also supporting ministries that are all around the globe. In fact, helped start, uh, start 16 new churches just this last year here in the Northwest, two of them that you were uh, uh, directly contributing even more beyond CP program money. Moving on, verse 18. I have received full payment and have made more than enough. I am amply supplied Supplied now that I have received from Epiroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So the really last point here is it makes God smile when I'm generous. It pleases him. And that only makes sense. You know, why, you know why it only makes sense that he would be so pleased when we give to him? Because God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. If you want someone to, to know how much you love them and, and give them the greatest gift you possibly could, I say share the gospel with them. Let them know Jesus. Share the gospel with them. Communicate how much you care for their eternal being, for their well-being, because the gospel is the greatest gift mankind has ever known. The death and resurrection of Christ where he paid for each of our sins is the best gift anybody could ever experience. If you really love someone, share them about Jesus. And that's why it makes Jesus smile whenever we are generous, whenever we give away. Because uh, sometimes people don't know how much you care until they know, uh, know how much, uh, until you, they know how much you care. They don't care how much you know until they can know how much you care. That was smooth. <laughs> what does God want from you the most? Some of you are thinking, what does God want from me the most? Well, God wants, God wants me to be a good person. God wants me to not sin that much. God wants me to be kind to people. God wants me to be faithful to my spouse. God wants me to not be a liar. God wants me to have integrity. But what does he want from you the most? More cynical people are like, wow, God seems to want my money. You know? well, what God wants from you the most is your heart. What God wants from you the most is your affection for him. He's given us these huge gifts. He's given us so much, and he loves us enough to die for us. And what's he want? He wants us to love him back. He wants us to say, Jesus, I also love you. I care about you. Thank you so much for what you've given to me. And, and, and you might say, well, then how is that love expressed? Can you give God a big smooch? Can you give God a big hug? God, I love you. You know, well, you know it's, that's, it's kind of odd, isn't it? So how do, you, how do you show God that you love him? How are you able to show where your heart belongs, that your heart is his? Well, the answer is where the most valuable of our commodities goes, is our time and our resources. These two commodities will direct you to where my heart is. I can tell you where my heart is by looking at my checkbook 
and looking at where my calendar is. And, and, and you'll see a lot of my family is on there. My wife and kids own a lot of my time and money. I spend a lot of time with people at, from our church and preaching the word. And so that's gratefully, that's a part of my life. But your heart will always follow your money. Some people ask, well, doesn't your money follow your heart? And I say, you know, actually, scripturally speaking, your money goes and then your heart goes with it. Why? Because that's your treasure. That's where your treasure is. If you wanted to say, uh, start investing in General Motors, you know, you would be amazed at what suddenly happens. You suddenly develop an interest in GM. You check the financial pages. You see a magazine article about GM, and you re you read every word. Even uh, through a month ago, you would pass right over it, and now you're reading the whole article. If you want to start, suppose you want to start helping kids in Africa who are dying of AIDS and, and you see an article on the subject, you get hooked and you'll begin uh, sending, sending money and resources there and, and looking at everything about those kids in Africa. If, if you wanted to start helping plant church in India and an earthquake hits India, you'll watch the news fervently and pray. Why? Because you are now invested. Do you wish you cared more about eternal things? And then I say, then reallocate some of your money and finances and time, not towards so many temporal things, but eternal things. Start putting more of your resources and your assets and your money and possessions and times and talents and energies into the things of God and watch what happens. Just watch what happens. As surely as a compass needle follows north, your heart will follow your treasure. As money leads, the heart follows. This is a scriptural truth. Found in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It just follows right along. When the Lord sees our heart, he smiles. It brings him pleasure and we... We give to what uh, concerns him when we're broken by the things that break him and who he cares about. Hopefully we come to understand that our relationship with him benefits us so much more than our relation to him benefits him. He's God. He has everything. He does not need paper with American presidents on it. He does not need the jewels that he created and made for us to discover and have fun digging in the dirt with and finding. He does not need any of those things because he has it all. He wants us. He wants us, and you need to know that you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. There's a story of a young kid. He's in the candy store, and the owner comes out and, and has a big bowl of candy and says, Here, reach in and grab some candy. And the little boy is timid and, and, and does, draws back and just sits there still. And so the store owner thinks he's just a shy kid, so he reaches in with his hand and gives him a handful of candy. Upon leaving the store, the little boy is talking with his dad. His dad said, son, I've never seen you so timid around candy when you've had an opportunity to grab some candy. And he said, well, dad, he said, I just saw that the store owner's hands were much larger than mine. <laughs> he got a lot more candy just waiting on the owner to give him. Does the God you believe in have big, huge hands? Is he taking care of you? You know he's a generous and loving God. When he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. And he knows what your needs are. He knows what your wants are even. And he just blesses us and blesses us and blesses us. And all these premises that we're looking at comes with a promise. It's finished up in verse 19. And Paul says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let him be all your needs. You can trust him. You can learn to love him. You can learn to lean into this God that has such a huge force of hands to take care of you and, and, and loves you and desires that we would spend time on his kingdom. The invitation this morning is for those that might be here that may not yet have a personal relationship with Christ. I said, man, I hope you would come to know him. Let today be the day of salvation for you. Let today be the day that you trust him and 
everything becomes yours because you have a father now that owns cattle on a thousand hills and owns every diamond mine and everything else with it. And he is so generous that he gave you even his son to take care of all of our sins. He's a God that doesn't hold anything back from sharing with you how much he loves you. He wants a relationship with you. And if you would just invite him in and receive him, he will come and make his home with you today. Now, for those that are already Christians, you're believers, you've known the Lord for a while, my challenge to you as we've been reading through this book of Philippians is to become more generous, to become more joyful. All the different things we've been looking at of how to receive joy in Christ. And this last one is just so evident that we can have more joy as we gain in more generosity. That's my prayer and hope for this church that we'll be like the church of Philippi. You can tell how much Paul had such affections for this church. Are we that church today? Well, then certainly we have some growing room, but can we move towards that church and have an effect in our community because of our generous heart and spirit? Would you stand with us during this time of invitation? I'll be in the back if you just would like to speak to me or pray with me about today's message. And,